Well, first of all, welcome to the uh, 2022 uh, major post uh, summit and poster session. Uh, my name is Tim Dickel. We have 40 minutes to get through the entire session. Hopefully, all of our speakers will really be here. Uh, we're going to allow five minutes for the presentation, two minutes for questions. It varies one way or the other, but, but we will be out of here on time. Uh, all the poster presenters can be contacted if, if you can't. If we run out of time for questions, you can contact all the poster presenters uh, by either the um, Event Mobi app under attendees, or uh, you can send them a message tab on the presenter's profile page. And um, we also want to make sure everyone goes in and votes on the People's Choice Poster Award. I believe that uh, closes at 11 today, so that's right after we're done here. So. Uh, it's your vote Sam, on the uh, your people's uh, choice poster. And so, uh, with no uh, further ado, we're going to have uh, Yasser present. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasser Rajabnur. I'm an emergency physician and telemedicine fellow at George Washington University. Uh, today, my poster title is about uh, development of telehealth elective curriculum for rotating residents. For a little bit background, as you guys know, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many healthcare providers adapted uh, telemedicine to deliver healthcare. However, many of these uh, providers had minimal experience using telemedicine and digital health technology, which raises a question about the quality of their healthcare delivery. Is it as equally effective as regular uh, uh, in-person visit? Do they understand the barrier of uh, telemedicine from their side as well as from the patient side? So we conceptualize this new, newly telehealth elective curriculum for rotating residents in order, uh, in, in order for the, in, in order for them to implement telemed telehealth during their future practice. So for the methods, our targeted learners are uh, residents across residency programs. We did the general need assessments for the learners by investigating previously published uh, telehealth curricula through mid ed portals. Also, we reviewed uh, the newly published AAMC uh, telehealth core competencies that was published in 2021. And AAMC telehealth uh, competencies consist of six domains. So we aimed uh, to develop our new curricular goals and objectives, as well as educational methods and content in order to be mapped with the double AMC core competencies. So as a result of our general need assessment, so the previously published curriculums, many of them are single sessions uh, or, or, or short workshops, and many of them don't cover the basic fundamentals of, tele of telehealth according to the double ANC competencies. And some of these curricula are designed for very, uh, for very specific or subgroup of learners. So we constructed a general goal of this curriculum, which basically to improve residents' basic knowledge about telehealth, ethics, and barrier of implementation, as well as clinical skill, so they could competently implement telehealth during their own practice and career, future career. And to achieve that goal, we constructed uh, seven measurable objectives. These objectives are divided into cognitive or knowledge-based objectives and uh, clinical skill-based objectives. And we designed the educational method to be matched with these objectives. So for the cognitive objectives like understanding basic terminologies about telemedicine and explaining the barrier to implementation and understanding health policies, so we're utilizing video sessions, small group discussions, and assigning articles to the learners. And in order to achieve uh, the clinical skill-based objectives like doing virtual physical examination, how to initiate uh, telehealth or video-based video, uh, video encounter, we're utilizing a virtual simulation by utilizing standardized patient and role playing. And another method is, uh, to, to let the learner observe real-time telehealth encounter to improve uh, uh, to improve their uh, virtual clinical skills. 
And also, while, while utilizing several formative uh, methods to assess our learner, as well as formal assessment method for their clinical skills, especially virtual physical exam, and also how to initiate the uh, best uh, telehealth encounter. As a conclusion, this newly developed uh, curriculum addressed the learner needs and also utilized uh, the WNC core competencies. Uh, but more research need to be done in order to assess learner outcomes by implementing this curriculum. And second is uh, to seek an opportunities, how to integrate this curriculum into actual EM residency program curriculums. And um, this concludes my poster. If not, thank you very much. Uh, of course, if you do think of any questions later or you would like to uh, contact us, you can do that through the, through the forums. Okay. Uh, we'll go on to our next presenter. Um, it's Tia. There you are. The, the guest girls. Tell me when you're ready. Okay, we're ready for you. Go on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, I am so glad to be with you today virtually and certainly am missing all of you in person. Um, our presentation through CTIR and Old Dominion University um, discusses how we've used utilized standardized patients to assess learner competence in a distant learning telehealth course. So as we all have discussed over the last day, the pandemic clearly introduced a rapid growth of care delivered through telehealth. But as educators, we've been called to prepare our students and current providers to meet the challenge of managing this mode of care delivery. The use of standardized patients um, has been well established in the cl for clinical education and has been quite useful. However, there's a small percentage of simulation experiences that are specific to telehealth, and there's really no mention of telehealth in the current standards for best implementation for standardized simulation. Furthermore, traditional standardized patient sessions within simulation centers require a great deal of coordination, student travel, and it's quite difficult to scale for large class sizes and to integrate specifically into, into distant learning. So the purpose of our project was to implement and evaluate a standardized patient program that we nested in a digital platform for training healthcare providers through an existing online telehealth certificate program. So briefly about the program, the participants complete a 10 module asynchronous telehealth certifica certification program that's been designed for different types of providers throughout the United States. The modules consist of narrated PowerPoints, videos, discussion boards, and evaluation tools. Prior to implementing the standardized patients, the course utilized participant learners to conduct virtual visits with one another. And this proved to be quite cumbersome, as you can imagine, some were in different time zones, different states. Um, so while it was effective, it also lacked the consistency and structured feedback that you get from a standardized patient pro, um, experience. So what we've done is we developed six standardized patient cases that were specifically designed to address each professional's needs. So we particularly looked at primary care, social work, physical therapy, pharmacy, and mental health, as these are um, predominant attenders of, the, of this particular course. After completing the first nine modules, the learners then participate in a self-scheduled standardized um, telehealth encounter appropriate for their profession. The standardized experience are designed to assess learner competence in history and physical, physical exam or history taking, physical examination, medication review, patient education, and telehealth etiquette. They all have a telehealth etiquette component, but these other components are really specific to the particular learner. The standardized patient will then evaluate the learner using validated tools that we've embedded into the program as part of the learning experience. Learners then receive immediate feedback from the standardized patient, along with follow-up written, um, a written scorecard with a link to their recorded sessions, so they're able to go back and view themselves. 
So to date, we have had 141 participants complete the standardized patient experience within five days of completing the online telehealth course. We're very excited to report that 80% of the learners found that their digital standardized patient session was more helpful or as helpful as a face-to-face -face standardized patient experience. All of the students agreed or strongly agreed that the digital session was helpful in improving their overall telehealth skills. Interesting too, participants requested, we started with a 15 minute session thinking that these are oftentimes busy providers or busy students that they didn't have the time for this experience. They wanted us to extend it to 30 minutes. They wanted more time for feedback. 50% of the students wanted a chance to go back and do the standardized patient experience again. 83% of the physical exam learners felt that the experience was as helpful as an in-person experience. 100% of the behavioral health learners felt the experience was as helpful as an in-person experience. We have quite a bit of qualitative statements, but three of um, the ones that we have on the poster here, are one student said they felt that it was very believable. They took it seriously to improve their telehealth skills and learned a great deal from the feedback, both good and constructive. Um, another stated that they were quite comfortable during the experience and that the SP made it seem as though it was a real scenario. It was great practice for developing their telehealth skills. It was realistic to real life um, client presenting problems. And they saw it as a way to learn how to build rapport over telehealth. And the SP was very helpful in the process. So in conclusion, we have found that telehealth training can be effectively and conveniently delivered through a digital standardized patient session, which can be easily integrated into online or distant learning courses and provide the ability to increase the scale of provider tra telehealth training. We did find that in developing the telehealth standardized patient experiences, it's critical that the standardized patient receive a specific education and pre preparation unique to telehealth encounters. I will tell you it's a bit easier now than this was several years ago because many of the standardized patients have actually had a telehealth encounter now, personally. Standardized, uh, we also found in, that the standardized that the standardized telehealth provider evaluation tools must be included into the curriculum and then used to evaluate the students. We found that at least 30 minutes should be allowed for this um, experience so that they could receive meaningful feedback from the standardized patient. So in closing, I would love to answer any questions that you may have. So uh, what was the experience of the, of the SP? What was the experience of the SP? So interesting, we're based in Virginia Beach and our standardized patient um, company that we're working with is based out of New York. So we spent quite a bit of time discussing the case with them, the telehealth experience. They went through our um, evaluation methods. We use a tip scale, which is um, a standardized instrument for evaluating interprofessional telehealth communication. So they had practices with one another, we had one on one, and we also sent them the videos that our students were watching in the course to see how to conduct these um, visits. Thank you. I meant, uh, uh, how did they see the, 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 the views of the education through the telehealth? Did they have any certain, like feedback that was done for, from the SP standpoint? How did the learners receive feedback from the SP? No, no, the SP, did they have any uh, uh, survey evaluation after they conducted yes. the survey? Yes, they did. The students evaluated the SPs afterwards, if that's what you're asking. And the SPs, I'm not sure what you're asking. The SPs had evaluation tools to evaluate the students, then the students had evaluation tools to evaluate the SP. And one of the things that we have found with this experience, as I'm sure you have with your SPs as well, is we have tried to stay consistent. Um, we have the pictures that you see on the poster are the, are the standardized patients that we utilized. So we've tried to be diverse and we've tried to be consistent and not change them out from session to session so that the SPs can become comfortable with their scenario and their case. 
Could you describe the Likert score for your SP sessions and tips for Calvin score for the end sample 141? I see 4.2s in several categories. Can you describe those a little bit more? Oh my goodness. Let me open up the, yes, let me open up the full view. So the full tip scale, we went through, I don't have the poster in front of me. Let me, sorry. Um, the tip scale, I'd be happy to send you. So we break down how to do an interview and how to do, can I can't open it up, I'm sorry, to see it in large scale. So it's a therapeutic environment, rapport. Um, I'd be happy to send the tip scale to you. So it's a validated tool. The students have had it in the course on how to conduct um, a solid interview, a solid standard or a solid um, visit with a patient. And then the standardized patient has that to score them on a score of, for example, um, did they feel that they communicated um, pacing um, correctly? Did they have good eye contact? Did they have motivational interviewing? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a message. I'll send you the survey so that you'll see, or the tools, so that you'll see what the students have in the class and then what the SPs are utilizing to evaluate the student. Okay. Thank you. Good and uh, I also I also have a question myself. Have you reached out to any other medical schools to see what they're doing? Because I know the University of Louisville has incorporated a telehealth into their standardized patient program. Also, are you, are you communicating? Is there a group of medical schools doing uh, talking back and forth about standardized? I, the only school that I'm communicating with now is um, one in Tennessee. And they're building a standardized patient virtual course as well for telehealth. And we're sharing our training for the standardized patients. We're sharing our instruments with them. And we're very interested in doing um, a larger scale study. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Don't want to get behind here. So we're gonna uh, move on. Uh, is Colton online? Not your case. There we go. Oh. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Colton Hood. Uh, I'm uh, in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the George Washington University. Uh, and I'm here to present our work on how we're expanding our help desk uh, and creating a digital curriculum to hopefully create connections beyond the clinical setting. Um, the help desk was initially uh, an in person uh, intervention, uh, it was a partnership with the Pacific or the Pennsylvania Avenue. Baptist Church, and we did workshops in person uh, to help members of our community uh, really utilize their personal technology and uh, to uh, impact their health um, or just in general. Uh, so it was kind of a help desk uh, in the community. Uh, generally, we tried to help them uh, connect with their digital resources uh, for their health, whether it be the patient portals or utilizing applications or digital devices uh, to track their health better. Uh, we've expanded that and kind of adapted that uh, since COVID. Um, and so now we were working with uh, Qualcomm and their uh, Qualcomm Digital Reach to Wireless Reach to uh, kind of understand the barriers in our community to utilizing health technology. Um, initially, uh, for this project, we were reaching out to people who didn't have any uh, smart devices or any digital technology. And we were kind of, we were providing them with a smartphone uh, and services and education about, about how to utilize that uh, to impact their health. Uh, and we moved that into uh, anyone who had kind of an outdated smartphone or, or any, any sort of barrier to utilizing the digital technology. So we didn't always provide people devices. If they had devices and they weren't utilizing them, we also uh, provided education. And uh, we used uh, our digital health curriculum um, on the left-hand side of the or right-hand side of the slide. Uh, you can see the overarching domains. Uh, kind of, it have it's basic digital health. How to use your medical device, then how to utilize things like their patient portal, and then how to actually share health information with their digital portal on top of just like accessing it and the basic utilization of the device. 
And then, you know, the, the, the final uh, domain to that is kind of how to improve those skills to communicate effectively with their PCP. So, so far, we, uh, we really only wanted to uh, recruit 25 patients. Uh, they were all uh, recruited from our emergency department and some of our outpatient clinics. Uh, they're all generally adults uh, having Medicaid or Medicare uh, and at least having one medical condition of hypertension. Uh, and they had to be interested in digital health coach, coach, coaching. Um, they were given a smartphone if they didn't have it. Uh, and then we used uh, uh, several surveys to kind of understand where they were at in life, um, kind of barriers to their care, what they knew about their health, what they knew about medication adherence, and then some things about loneliness and self-efficacy and uh, their digital health competencies. Uh, then we had a pretty... Uh, there's a comprehensive teaching uh, in, in enrollment. Uh, they're given their phone. Uh, you know, things are installed. Can, they go over accounts and connect to Wi-Fi. It's a pretty intensive uh, enrollment process. And then uh, there's a longitudinal curriculum that goes over um, about six months. Uh, and then we follow with them, uh, usually use, using a Zoom uh, meeting, kind of meet with them periodically. Uh, and they kind of continue to try and track their progress to see uh, how they are progressing and how uh, kind of connecting them has impacted their health or even their daily lives. Um, most of our patients are African American, which is uh, indicative of the population in DC. Um, a lot of them receive uh, Social Security and disability, and then um, most of them also uh, rely on public uh, transportation. It's kind of interesting in our in our um, city and Ward 7 or 8, where we're kind of in 5, where we're focusing on it, uh, people often have to travel pretty far to get their health care. Um, there's only one hospital down in Ward 7 and 8. And so uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and then we, we have one patient that's just about to finish the curriculum. And so uh, this is pretty preliminary with the presentation. And we were hoping that uh, we would be able to kind of learn uh, how we can be more effective in our community and see what interventions we could use to kind of uh, use technology to impact our patients lives and see what you know what's necessary for you know maybe the folks that don't have um, either the best grasp or don't have the technology in general thank you very much any questions in the line? Well, excellent presentation. Well, thank you, Dr. Um, so we'll go on to our next presentation. Nick, you can stand wherever you want. Sure. I tell a medical professional to not make this a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know what the best place to stand is. I feel like I should be in the back of the room or something. Yeah. All right, I go there. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Nick. Um, I serve as the Emerging Technology and Telehealth for the Delaware Libraries. Um, I'm an accidental librarian. My background is actually in chemical engineering, but I stumbled into the world of telehealth for the last couple of years. Um, so if you heard me speak a little bit last night, this is sort of like the Delaware Library's latest effort to provide wraparound support for the patrons that we see in the libraries. Um, we're oftentimes seeing people that aren't accessing healthcare from traditional means, or there's a stigma associated with them going to a walk-in center, um, an FQHD, et cetera. So really the focus of this project is the uninsured and underinsured populations with a pilot starting in Southern Delaware, which is where our most rural populations are. So I give some examples on the top left there of um, statistics that we're looking at, depression rates increasing in Delaware, drug overdose deaths. Um, in fact, Delaware is the second highest in the country for drug overdose deaths per capita. So when we saw that, um, we tried to figure out ways that we could better help the community. Uh, and a lot of these people are coming into public libraries. Um, I also found this interesting. This Kaiser Grand Foundation poll reported that only 10% of mental health needs are, are met. Um, in Delaware, which is 18% lower than the national average. Um, and then also in 2021, over 11% of Delaware reported they had not seen a doctor due to cost. Um, and then for Medicaid and I'm sure there were long wait times. So basically, 
we are trying to figure out how can we leverage the libraries as these cornerstones in the community um, to better preserve, better serve um, these demographics, provide quality healthcare at a uh, in a timely manner. We also coupled this with a device funding initiative so that um, patrons can now check out a Chromebook and or a Wi-Fi hotspot. So when the library is closed, they can access the same um, care from the comfort of their homes or wherever they were. Um, because we're looking at access to that health and digital accessibility um, section there, it's all about the uh, digital divide that exists in Delaware, specifically in our Sussex County, our most rural county. And then the last part is looking at really the health literacy in the U.S. Um, so I found this pretty interesting. Nearly 36% of adults in the U.S. have low health literacy with disproportionate rates affecting uh, lower income Americans eligible for Medicaid. So what well, I did in my program and other libraries across the country now started doing the same thing is um, hiring staff that are typically some sort of social work backgrounds. And they're really there to assist patrons, but not only at the time of the appointment, but there's a lot of social determinants of health that go into just getting them an appointment. So getting them signed with Medicaid, understanding and interpreting their health information. Um, this, this is what my staff also assist with. So the program in the middle here, um, we launched this in the spring of last year um, in three rural libraries in Southern Delaware. Um, you can sort of see this picture of blue here. It's about, uh, I used to call it like a glorified telephone booth. It's about uh, four feet by eight feet by eight feet tall. It can fit about two to three people inside. Soundproof, have the filtration, UV sanitation inside of it. Um, and it's equipped with an iPad um, for now. That's just how we started the program. So it's basic, um, you know, follow up behavioral health that it could be used for. I should note that we're not providing care, we're basically just an easy access point for patrons. Um, there was a lot of concern when I first started talking about this program about liability. So every patron that comes in, I say patron, I realize you guys say patient. Uh, so I'll go back and forth between the two. They sign a little liability release form because we don't want to hold the libraries responsible for any uh, security, uh, HIPAA concerns, et cetera. Let's see where I'm at. I talked about the navigators that are there to help with patron uh, scheduling appointments, assisting with technology. Um, and we do rely on a lot of partnerships to launch this program. So our biggest one is Christiana Care, uh, their Center for Virtual Health. Um, BB Health is another one in Southern Delaware and some of our FQHCs. We do collect survey data. So this entire program is grant funded. Um, it took me about a year and a half to launch it because I had to go out and raise uh, close to a million dollars in grant funding uh, to launch the, these three sites. So because of that, and because I'm a data nerd, uh, we have surveys before and after to learn about why they're in the, uh, the booth, uh, what their previous experience is uh, seeking healthcare, uh, and, and things of that nature. I'll go over some of the results here. And we deploy this in conjunction with the Chromebook and Wi-Fi hotspot initiative. They can borrow up these devices for up to a month at a time. We're currently looking at a pilot program where we can actually transition them into Verizon uh, a low monthly cost plan, so they're not relying on our Wi-Fi hotspots for perpetuity. Let's see what else? And there's also surveys that collected on the you know digital access. Like, do they currently have a internet in their homes? Um, it's of that nature. So results so far, uh, we've had about 500 patrons use um, the booths and devices in some capacity. I say telehealth. Um, but really, I should be saying we're teleservices because we see people using this for uh, employment, uh, immigration support. We actually have one old lady who comes into one of our libraries every week and uses her dating app. So I say it's, it, it is fully wrapped around the support. Uh, yeah. We, so what's interesting with the devices is we don't specifically say you need to use this device for healthcare. We have different information on it that says, you know, this is how you can get back into it telehealth appointment, et cetera. Um, so without promoting anything, 33% of the device borrowers are using it for some sort of health care, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then we've helped about 100 residents sign up with health insurance in the last year as well. For the, specifically for the Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots, we've actually, that's had a huge uptick, about uh, 1,300 patients have loaned other device, uh, 340 which did not have internet in their home before, uh, and about 200 only use internet uh, through their phones. In terms of decreased lead time to see a healthcare provider, we sort of did this, like how would you rate this experience based on previous 
uh, encounters and 100% said that this made it easier than usual for them to visit a doctor or mental health professional. Um, 99% rated seven or higher that they would use this again or refer to somebody. Um, and just in terms of some demographics, 65% are men who identify English as their primary language. 45% um, are Black or African American, which is the second highest. And uh, there's a pretty even split between participants seeking counseling, therapy, legal job interviews. So in closing, what's next for us? Um, we have a lot of interest to launch both of these initiatives statewide. Now. So the, the hotspots and Chromebooks and the telehealth booths. Um, I have support from my, our, our Delaware Congresswoman um, and other uh, federal uh, programs to go to nine additional sites this summer across the state. So that's urban, suburban, and rural libraries. And we're going to purchase probably three or four hundred more devices to also scale this up. Um, and then we're, we're really trying to make sure that we're targeting these uninsured and underinsured populations. So instead of just focusing on traditional marketing means, um, social media, radio, billboards, uh, we're also going to community leaders and talking to them. We're tabling at events to talk about this program, going to places of worship, supermarkets to really get the word out on the grounds. Um, so that's all I got. Let's take some questions. There are other type of programs like this that you've seen before. Yeah, so, uh, and yes, but nobody's talking. So in the last month, I actually decided to put together a national working group on this institution. Yeah, so we had our first meeting last month. I probably had about 20 states represented. And these are not only state libraries, but also public health departments. Um, there's a few other like nonprofits that are involved too. Spoke with the consortium in the webinar in August so that we could get it out to the other telehealth resource centers as a new way to um, kind of approach this. Yes. So, we're having our next meeting in a couple of weeks. I can definitely add any bit to the survey. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I'm Erin Sapelian. I am in, uh, at ODU. Um, I am a DMP student. I also am a psych MP almost graduate next week. Um, my background is civil engineering. I was a civil engineer for 10 years. Met my husband during the Marine Corps in the nursing area. Um, I did this project. This is my doctorate, uh, my DMP project. This is my practicum. So it's not completed. This is my first um, semester. And it's moving quick. Um, Dr. Gustin is my advisor. She's on my paper with Dr. Pierre as well. So what happened was um, during COVID, the Hospital near us, CK, um, was short staffed. Lots of kids were popping positive with Omicron and Delta variant, and they just didn't have enough staff. And so, Dr. Gustin and Dr. Parrott, who work at CHKD and ODU, helped develop this new academic practice partnership um, where we can utilize ODU's resources and DMP students to lift this emergency call center. So I met with Dr. Gustin and we got 31 DMP students to volunteer while leveraging their hours. So they got clinical hours for the DMP and CHPD got three um, staff um, by entities and DMP students. So we had to facilitate the, and everything was done at home, so from all of our homes. So we had to facilitate all the training and all the platforms. So it was a telecall. There was no Face numbers and like to them. Zoom or anything like that it was Jabber. And so we used Jabber for the phone. The calls came directly to the students um, through the clinic's um, phone line. And then we had to use triage logic for the Barton Schmidt protocol. And then we had to access Cerner and get into power chart. We needed three different logins, we needed three screens, and um, I had to do training videos and lots of Zoom sessions with the students to train them up 
but I worked at CHD, so I knew how to lose all that and I had some background in engineering, so it's kind of cool. So, um, as of March 18th, we stopped the call center when things were slowing down to 818 calls. 97% of those calls that we answered, we did not transfer. We triaged, we educated, we took the calls about vaccine um, information, um, exposure, testing, where to get tested, and CHPD stopped testing asymptomatic kids. Um, we used the Virginia Department of Health, the CDC, and so only three percent of those kiddos got transferred back to the clinic where they had to actually get up the phone. We served 21 of the practices and three of the urgent cares. We also gave test results for parents who had gone in to get a test and it takes two to three days to get the results. They could call in, we could read the results, and then we could chart and we would, um, power chart and we read the results and send that to the doctors who moved up and we had to come back to that. So moving forward, this is a great platform um, to use at CHPD or anywhere um, to follow up on asthma. New diagnosis of asthma kiddos um, need follow up. So we could just use students to gain clinical hours and also help the hospital. We could use it for behavioral health and the second we have kids come in the ED all the time, they go home with the safety plan and then one. No one's checking on them. They're probably waiting three months to get um, an appointment with a psychiatrist or a sleep MP to get med management or get into, into a therapy session. Um, and then also, like obesity and children, you know, do education, get a nutritionist or, you know, a clinic if they need so. And any other emergencies um, that come up. Just be there. Yeah. And we're hoping to pivot to a telehealth where we can have um, the parents or the patients on the screen. Because then the nurse practitioners can get hours. Um, so again, there's a lot I still have to do, um, but I'm going to keep working on it, and maybe next show I'll have more results. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Dr. Gessner, are you there? Do you have anything to say? I am here. Um, I thought about your presentation yesterday when we heard the leadership. I, I went to the leadership section. I don't know if anybody in here was at that session, but just being brave and innovative. And I think this project um, certainly speaks to that. We did not lift this out as a telehealth deliverable. We wanted to, but we needed to respond quickly to the needs of the hospital. And had we moved to a um, traditional telehealth deliverable, it would have taken us weeks to have moved forward. We felt it was more important to address the need, um, do solid 360 evaluations and be prepared for um, a telehealth deliverable as we move forward. Great posters today. All these ideas that are thinking out of the box so refreshing and I've got to be stale and then can't tell out for 22 years and I would see all these new things that people are thinking about how we can tell out. It's just great. So I want to thank everybody for attending. You got just a few minutes left to uh, go online and uh, vote for your um, uh, your your favorite poster. And also all posters are available online uh, with a one minute elevator speech. All the sessions have been recorded in a couple of weeks. You'll be able to see the entire, um, the entire presentation. So, with that, I'm going to give you all. I landed right on time. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you.